the book of Colossians, part 10, it says, not so fast. At the conclusion of our last session, which was lesson number nine last week, we indicated that we would be moving into chapter three with this teaching, which is part 10. However, not so fast. We need to dwell a little longer in the closing verses of chapter two. So we're not at chapter 3 just yet, as we said we would be, and thought sincerely that we would be. Here is chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. We read it first. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of Sabbath days. Look this way for a moment. Paul is setting out a list of things here that he wants to discuss. Don't let any man judge you in meat or drink in respect of a holy day or the new moon or relating to the Sabbath, which are only a shadow, verse 17, of things to come, but the fulfillment of the shadow, the body is Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he has not yet seen, or not seen, vainly puffed up by his own fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Verse 20, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you Colossians still subject to these ordinances which are, I'm adding, which are being pushed onto you by the Gnostics and the false teachers? And by the way, look this way a second. There's more false teachers in the church today than there were in Paul's day. Many, many more. No, I don't mean those outside the church. People can think, well, you know, Mohammedanism or Jehovah Witness. No, I'm talking about inside the church. The warning is that they will rise up from within you. That's what Paul said. He said, I say it with tears, they will rise up within and preach false doctrine from inside the church, what we would call the evangelical church. Verse 20 again. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to these rules and regulations, these ordinances, such as taste not, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of man, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship. That's the whole thing about Colossians. The false teachers were teaching worship so-called out of the intellect instead of from the Holy Spirit. And humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. And then I say here, before we leave chapter 2, we have to look more and it can be tough to do this, but we have to look a little bit more in depth relating to Paul's answers on these three enemies of the cross. Legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. We repeat that. Legalism, that's chapter 2, verse 16. Mysticism, two, 16 and 17, that should be. Mysticism, 2, 18 and 19, asceticism 2, verses 20 through 23. So those are the three great enemies of the church today. Legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. First of all, we look at legalism. We get warmed up after a little bit and get into some heavy, even controversial stuff. Here again, under the title of legalism, here again are verses 16 and 17 of this chapter, just read. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, drink, holy day, one of the festivals. Remember the seven feasts of Israel, a feast or a festival, or the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Don't let anybody judge you, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Notice these four areas where legalism was coming in to bind through these so-called super-intelligent spiritual people, the Gnostics. They were introducing laws relating to food and drink, 
Laws relating to the seven feasts of Israel, sometimes called the festivals. Laws regarding the new moon. And very dogmatic on the Sabbath day. Now, it wasn't only, of course, look this way a second, it wasn't only the Gnostics. We told before how it was Greek philosophers on the one hand. There were Jewish Judaizers, legalists on the other hand. But the biggest amount of the thrust of the errorist was, of course, from these Gnostics. But in a totality, Paul deals with legalism in this four-pronged attack that was happening to the church at Colossae. It's happening today. People get into bondage regarding food and drink, into bondage regarding festivals, the new moon, and the Sabbath day. So Paul makes it clear, relating to food and drink, that the Old Testament dietary laws no longer apply. I want you to get that. The Old Testament dietary laws no longer apply. Now look this way again. Somebody may say, well, those laws were good and they can help me physically in my body. If you want to do that, that's perfectly fine. That's not what he's talking about. These laws, the dietary laws, food and drink, do eat this and don't eat that, have nothing to do with your soul's salvation. That's the point that he's making. And these people were introducing this as, well, Jesus is not sufficient. Jesus is not supreme. Jesus doesn't have the preeminence. And what you need is, okay, you can have Jesus if you want, but you better start following these food laws. You mustn't eat this and you must do that. There could be many of those things that are good for your body. Go ahead and do it. Don't be stupid regarding your body, but it has nothing to do with your soul's salvation. That's the point he's making. We could say a lot more about that, but I'm sure we don't have to. Nothing to do with it. And it was a big thing then. And there are some churches today where it's still a big thing, where it is associated with spirituality. It's associated with being saved or being right with God. It has nothing to do with it. That's what Paul says here. Don't let anybody judge you. There's no judging about that. You get saved by the blood of Christ. Forget the dietary laws having anything to do with being saved because the devil forever wants to add to Christ. It's Christ plus. It's get saved by Jesus plus do this, this, this. But I've often said, you know, you get saved by Calvary plus nothing. And the moment you add to Calvary, you just took away from Calvary and you diluted its power. So that's what he's saying to them. Forget it. It does no, no bearing. Then the second one was, in fact, there's a scripture I give here. We might as well read that first. Here is Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It has nothing to do with keeping the dietary laws. This was a shock to the system of many of them, of course, who were raised with the Jewish teaching. Paul says, forget it. Well, I thought we had to do this to, to, to merit God's blessing. No, it's all be done away. Those were types and shadows. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Well, what is it? It's been replaced. It is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness is imparted gift of righteousness. D.K. Usine, that's the word there, which gives us peace. And when you get peace, you get joy. And then you can work out your own salvation in fear and trembling regarding dietary laws or anything else you want to do regarding your own health. That's fine. Just don't introduce it as something that's important to your soul's salvation. Get it, friends? That's what Paul's saying. Just in a few words, he just knocks it out of the ballpark. That's it. And then the festivals was number two. The festival was one of the annual Jewish celebrations such as Passover as revealed in Leviticus chapter 23. You can turn over and then you can look back this way for a moment. Some of the teaching that was coming into Colossae was, yes, you could say by Jesus, but you still have to look and perform the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles and all these things. Now, we're strong believers in the teaching of those seven festivals because they point to Christ. But we have enough sense to know that you don't have to go back and actually do the Passover and slay an animal and do it in order to please God. They had to do that in the Old Testament. That was fulfilled in Christ. That doesn't have to be done anymore. 
Our joy is finding out the facts of the Passover and unleavened bread and these various things, the seven of them, which I'll speak about Easter Sunday morning, first fruit Sunday morning. We, we go back and we get the, the, the feeling and the blessing and we see how it's all fulfilled in Christ and we rejoice in it. But we don't have the slightest conviction that we've got to go back and perform the actual ceremonies and do what they had to do. For instance, go out and live in booths for seven days. You don't have to do that anymore. It's over. But they were pushing this onto the church at Colossae. Paul said, forget it. It's not right. These seven festivals are great, but they have nothing to do with our soul's salvation. This is a big thing to say because the entire of Judaism was built upon these seven festivals as revealed in Leviticus chapter 23. Paul said, it's over. And that takes us to number three, which is the new moon. The new moon relates to Numbers 28, verses 11 through 14. And I'm not going to read all of that. Just go down to the end of those verses, 11 through 14. And it says, Sacrifices were also offered on the new moon or on the first day of the month. And they were insisting that that old law be kept. And on the new moon, which is the first day of the month, you make certain sacrifices in order to appease a God that Paul says was already appeased when Jesus died on Calvary. That has been done away with. You have to understand the difference between the shadow and the substance. And that's what they didn't have, and they were being inundated with this foolish teaching, uh, a fight, as it were, between the substance uh, and, and, of course, just the shadow, which Paul said ought to have been done away with because it was done away with. But then the biggest one of all, and the one with the most controversy, was the Sabbath day. Are we to keep the Sabbath day today? Well, look this way for a moment. Two things about the Sabbath day. Number one, no human being on earth can keep the Sabbath day as outlined in the Old Testament. It's an impossibility. It can't be done. And if you tried to do it, you would put yourself in such ridiculous bondage. And you have to know that in Hebrews chapter 4, Paul clearly says, in fact, he invented a, a Greek word. He invented a Greek word called sabbatismos. And sabbatismos simply says that the Sabbath day was a day in the Old Testament, a day when God rested. But when Jesus died, it's no longer a day, it's an experience. And we rest. Just as God worked for six days and rested on the seventh, so we don't work anymore for our own salvation. We rest in Christ. So we fulfill the Sabbath not by keeping Old Testament laws. We fulfill the Sabbath by knowing that Jesus died for us and we enter into that rest. And Paul's word is sabbatismos, which, as I say, he made up. There must be a living letter back there on it if you want to pursue that further. But he said it's nothing to do with the actual keeping of the Sabbath day. Now, there's good people today, like the Seventh-day Adventists and others, who get all confused about the Seventh day, and they'll, uh, the Sabbath day, rather, and they will tell you that it was the Roman Catholic Church that changed it. That's foolishness. I mean, that, that is just utter foolishness and nonsense. Let's read on a little bit. The Sabbath day has brought many people into bondage. The early church, church met on Sunday, the first day of the week. Are you aware of that? The Sabbath was for the Old Testament, but the new church, the young church, met on Sunday, the first day of the week. For instance, it says in Acts 20 and verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Well, I guess that gives me a little comfort there. I, I don't do too bad. He kept going to midnight. Anyway, notice that it was upon the first day of the week. Let's move on. We must not forget that the early church, the new church, after Pentecost and Jesus had died, they knew the difference between the Jewish Sabbath, when Jesus was in the tomb, he was in the tomb on the Sabbath, and the first day of the week, that's when Christ rose from the dead at the end of the Sabbath. The end of Saturday is when he rose from the dead. Matthew 28, 1, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Here also is 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And then it says, and I just quoted it a moment ago, and I'm going over these things very, very fast. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us about the Sabbath being a type and shadow. See our notes on Sabbatismus. It means a place of rest. 
Look back this way. When people today try to keep the laws, it's just awful. You know, there are Jewish people today, for example, on the Sabbath on a Saturday, they believe that they cannot switch on a light because that's working. And so they'll hire a person to come in and turn the light on for them. And it could be argued that that's working just to hire him. And these are good, sincere people. The Seventh-day Adventists are good, sincere people. But you can't keep it. But it's worse than that. It takes away from the whole idea of what the substance did for the shadow. The shadow was that God would have a Sabbath day to show after working there is rest. Comes to us. Jesus died for us. We don't have to work for our salvation. We enter into his rest so that we have an experience. Hebrews chapter 4, it's the Greek word sabbatismos, where Paul says, We are Sabbathing. We are Sabbathing. We would say it, you know, we are, if we were using the word Sunday, we would say Sundaying. We are Sabbathing. We are in peace because. The Sabbath day is no longer a day. It's an experience of peace with God because we've had the glorious revelation. We don't have to work. You can cease from your own religious works trying to be saved. Think of all the religious works that go on. Think of all the good Mormon people who keep getting baptized for their loved ones. So they've got the biggest genealogy outfit in the whole world because they keep going back to find out their great-grandfather so they can get him saved too, you know, by getting baptized for him. Or think of the Jehovah Witnesses who think the more books they sell, the more works is going to be ascribed to them in the kingdom of God. Think of the Roman Catholics. That's about the most terrible of all and all the works that they do, including on their knees sometimes to get some kind of peace with God. I'm from a Catholic country. I know about it. The good news is you don't have to do any of those things. Jesus died on Calvary for you and you just accept him and you'll enter into peace and you'll experience peace. And when you experience peace, you're experiencing the fulfillment of the Sabbath day. That's it. That's totally it. Now, you can be sure these are all subjects within themselves. And I point you out again back there, I presume, or Stephen would help you to get our literature on sabbatismos. I got over that one pretty quickly. The next one is much more difficult. Well, not difficult, but involved. Mysticism, legalism, and then mysticism. This is a very serious one also. Kind of suck in your breath, and let's go to this next one. Here again is chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. This was hurting the church at Colossae. It's hurting the church today far more. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels and intruding into those things which he has not seen and he's vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. Look this way. Mysticism had struck the church. What is mysticism? You know what a mystic is? Kind of spooky. Out there in the spirit world where things happen. Either good things or when things go bump in the night. Mysticism had come in. Mysticism is everywhere today. I had the great terrible misfortune today to turn on to Christian television. And I shouldn't have done it. But I did. In order to see somebody, there was a man and a woman, and it was pure 100% deception and mysticism. But it comes into your home all the time, and we've got to stop for a few minutes and talk about it. This is what they were saying today, late afternoon television. They had got a cross from somewhere, and all you had to do was write out your prayer request and send them in, and they were going to nail it to this wooden cross. Anybody see this telecast today? No? You're a well-trained congregation. God bless you for not looking. But this is what you had to do. And then, of course, you send an offering. That's always the big thing. And the offering was either $77 or $770 or $7,700. And when you do that, the moment you do that, and the moment when your money's received and obviously clears the bank, then God sees that your money's good and he will dispatch an angel. And the angel's going to go forward and he's going to do a whole host of things for you. Take care of your enemies. Make sure that you prosper. Everything's on prosperity nowadays. And it's going to be absolutely fantastic what's going to happen. Furthermore, you'll get a free book on the seven blessings of Passover, which is the work of a scoundrel. That's the honest truth. And I just can't stand it sometimes listening to it. Probably I ought to name names. 
But uh, let me just go a little farther and say this. Mysticism is in the church today in such a gigantic way in the fulfillment of what Jesus and Paul and Peter and John warned us about. It's all over the place. And because Christian television gets into all our homes, therefore it comes through Christian television more than any other thing. Now, there's certain people you can watch in Christian television you'll get blessed out of. Who can't be blessed watching Adrian Rogers? Who can't be blessed watching Charles Stanley? for example, and I don't get to see those men very much, but you have to listen for five minutes. Whether you agree with them all the way or not, you know they're solid, good men. They're not scoundrels. But there's others. That's an absolute and total disgrace. And uh, they're into what you would call mysticism. I heard one of them one night. And he said he died and went to heaven, and then come back again, of course, because he's living to tell the story. But he was in heaven mysticism. He was in heaven. And he was in heaven. He saw this, that, and the other thing. And then one of the things in particular that struck him was, he said, a God, he said, I'd like to ask you a question. He said, I can see you here. And this is dead serious. He said, I see you here, and I see Jesus here, but I can't find the Holy Ghost. This is on Christian television. And he said, I just want to know, where is the Holy Ghost? And the Father spoke and said unto me, the Holy Ghost, don't you know? He's on the earth doing my work. And I said, that seems good to me. And therefore, his deep craving to find out what the Holy Ghost was was satisfied, and it was all over. Now, somebody in that church, was that big, huge church in, in Houston, ought to have jumped up and said, stop, false prophet, stupid thing. Nothing to do. God is ubiquitous. That's a big fancy word that simply means he's omnipresent. God is omnipresent everywhere at the same time. And this foolishness of saying that God's up there and here's the Holy Ghost down here. And as one leader out of the Toronto laughter uh, movement one time said, uh, this was a prophecy from the, the, the wife of the leader of the Toronto so-called blessing. This was a prophecy. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy Ghost is lonely because he misses the Father because the Holy Ghost is on earth and the Father is so far away in heaven and he also misses Jesus since he went back again who kept him company when he was on the earth. This is the kind of stuff that we're being told. Now, what, what, what about, friends, the gifts of the Holy Spirit? The Apostle Paul said there were nine gifts of the Holy Spirit put into the church. I cannot read one place where it ever says they were taken out of the church. Therefore, they're still there. We could talk about it on another occasion, but they're broken up into three threes. Three of this and three of that and three of the other. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are marvelous. But let me tell you, most of what you will see today parading as the gifts of the Holy Ghost is an absolute and total insult. The church is being conned just in a... a, a a, a gigantic way. For example, let me just give you a little illustration of this. When we arrived from Ireland, we arrived, as you know, first of all, in Kissimmee. Uh, we, we, we started to work there in Kissimmee that just took off like a rocket. I mean, it really did. The, we didn't know anybody. In the first service, in addition to our family, we had three people. On the fourth service, there was over 150 people. It was just uh, incredible. Anyway, there was a man there uh, who kind of helped us in various ways, but his wife resisted us spiritually. The funny thing was, she was kind in every other way. She invited us over to her home, said, you're from a new country, and give us coffee and cookies. And she was as nice as could be until it came to spiritual things. Then she'd get mad with us. So we kind of just kept apart in that area. And uh, we were having a service one time, and she came in. She didn't come into our meetings. Her husband would come in. In fact, he had play the piano and sing for us. She wouldn't come in. She came in, she had some need. And we went and prayed for her, and she fell. Well, the service finished, and I left. And one lady, a doctor's wife, stayed with her just to help her, you know, because this was obviously very new to her. And I can't honestly remember the time to the minute, but it was close to four hours that she lay there. Four hours. And when she got up, kind of almost in a drunken state, said that she had never felt the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit like it. God does from time to time some amazing things, including slaying in the Spirit. I usually say to people, try to take it standing up. 
Because if you don't do that, many times you give a platform to a manifestation of the flesh. The trouble comes in when this happens that I'm going to describe. You get a preacher, and the whole thing is built around people falling. And I just think of it on television. There the whole choir falls. Well, big deal. And all the elders fall. Or whatever. And then what happens is, and I've seen it several times myself, somebody falls and the order is given, pick them up so we can knock them down again. And we say, Jesus' name, and he falls down again. Pick him up again. In Jesus' name, and he falls down again. And then it becomes like a joke. And then after a while, it turns into connived, contrived laughter. Have you ever seen this laughter thing on television? Can God make a person laugh? God can do anything in the world he wants to. But the Bible says in the Old Testament, God spoke through prophets and visions and so forth. He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. It's through the Word. Our ministry has got to be Word-oriented, not experience-oriented. It's got to be something with objectivity. It's not subjectivity. And, and we must be careful we're not built around experiences. Uh, uh, somebody said, did you feel that? You know, the Pentecostal shakes. Here's my personal opinion. My personal opinion is this. Now listen to this real carefully. I believe that the so-called, this is a community church. I believe that the so-called Pentecostal doctrine, that they have, this is after being in the ministry all these years, it's just in a personal opinion, I believe they have probably more truth than, than any other group. I believe that. However, the demonstration of what we see from most of those same people leads me also to say this. I believe when you watch Christian television that the Pentecostals and the Charismatics, God bless them, have got more idiots per square yard than all other denominations put together. You have a string of them lined up, from Bob Tilton to Mike Murdoch to Steve Munsey to, and I could go on and on. I wouldn't listen to any of them for five seconds without knowing that I'll be led into error. Mike Murdoch has told us that he has studied the Bible, that there are 58 blessings. And that God told him, 58? I thought there's more than 58 blessings in the Bible. But he said there's 58, but God told him something else. It wasn't God. It was an evil spirit told it to him. But it became very, very wealth-making for him. Very, very wealthy man. God told him that each of the blessings was represented by a dollar. And if you send in $58 per child, that will guarantee the child would be saved. And so you can get all your loved ones saved for a charge of $50 each. In fact, he says, why don't you make out four different checks if you've got four different children? And, and put down the little memo line, Billy or Susan or Joe or Harry or whatever, $58. Friends, it's a crime. It is so evil. And nobody will say a word against it. One time I phoned up the president of a Christian television station when this performance of evil was going on his station. I said, stop it. Stop this nonsense. This is an insult to God and his word. Stop it immediately. You know what that president told me? He said, Leslie, it works. He said, the phones are ringing off the hook. The $58 are coming in. We're going to do it. The church is subject to such garbage. Here's Bob Tilton. I know Bob Tilton. Bob Tilton's been in my home. This is many years ago, till he went screwy in the head. But very wealthy screwy, let me tell you. And Bob will be sitting there looking at the camera, and then suddenly he will break into this gibberish, and the gibberish is always interpreted. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, send $1,000. Or as Mike Murdoch said some time ago, what you're supposed to do is send him $1,000, and if you do, you will have no car accidents for a year. Now, God have mercy on you, of course, if, if you miss the payment by one day because God will probably get you on the 366th day. Isn't it awful, friends, what's happening? Bob will keep on saying, pay your vow, pay your vow. What is it? It's mysticism. It's mysticism. And, and we get what, all over the place with these visions people have. Here's the, here, listen, 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 listen. That doesn't mean there's no such thing as a vision or a dream or the gifts. I am not one who's against those things per se. But what we're seeing is the misuse of them in such a big way that if Paul had it bad with mysticism relating to 
the Colossian church, it's nothing in comparison to what we're having today. Tell me, have you never been on one of these guys' mailing lists that you get? Did you ever get an envelope with a letter with four or five little coins or something, you know, and you pray over it? And you send one back and you'll get your miracle. Or sometimes they have a sheet of paper and a hand is drawn out on it. And when you put your hand on top of it, you're going to get your miracle. The whole thing's from hell. I remember many years ago when W.V. Grant, I knew W.V. Grant. I preached in W.V. Grant's church, but this is W.V. Grant Jr. I'm talking about now. This goes back many, many years. He sent out a balderdash letter like that to scam the people of God. And somebody contacted us and said, what should I do about this? letter. What should I do? Is this of God? Will I send this money and get a miracle? And I remember, this is several years ago, I remember exactly what I told them to say. Dear W.V. Grant, go to hell. Yours sincerely, and sign it, and then put a P.S. and say, Leslie Hale told me to say that. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. The beautiful, listen to it, the beautiful ministry of healing is being destroyed by associating it with money. It used to be you could be healed because Jesus died on Calvary. You could heal today according to your seed faith gift. Did you ever notice that, friends? Send in your seed faith gift and you get this, this, and this. And there's some of them that are so disgraceful that it's terrible. They're out there in the mystic world. What is the mystic world? Well, they simply on camera, they can close their eyes and say, the Lord says this and the Lord says that and the Lord says the other thing. And the Lord always says it within the time allotted for the television program. Isn't that amazing? God never goes over three seconds. He always gets cut off in time to get it to come in. The church is being scammed. The church is being scammed. Uh, recently, uh, uh, at a two o'clock program in the afternoon, somebody who had been put in jail for doing evil and scamming people is back. And this time, he's selling rocks from Calvary. I kid you not. I kid you not. Rocks, genuine rocks from Calvary. You cannot live with them. You talk about the, 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 the slick oil, you know, salesman. You, you talk about the snake oil, they call it, salesman. So you have to have so many rocks, and when you get this, of course, you've got to buy an extra $100 worth for your friends, and then all oh, they'll get saved, and all oh, they'll get blessed. I feel like sending a bunch of them, shut up, you bunch of rascals. There's not one of them will spend 20 minutes with an exegesis of this word. There's not one of them will dig into this word. Why? Because it's too much bother, it's too much trouble, and it doesn't produce to them the money that they need and the money that they want, so that so many of the TV preachers have become money-raising scoundrels. And I'm glad to tell you, friends, in this ministry, all that you see that has been paid and all that's happened over here, and we're far from perfect, but every dime has come in without one trick ever being played on anybody. Not one trick on anybody. Hallelujah. We are going to trust God or else we will be out of this ministry. I want nothing to do with it. So don't you believe this garbage? You know, oh, the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that. This uh, uh, Steve Muncy, and by the way, recently I noticed he's, he's at a doctorate. Do you notice they're all doctors now? Do you know why? Because they give each other doctorates. That's true, which may, means they're liars. I remember one group contacted us and wanted to make me an honorary doctor. I forget it. I don't want to forget I don't. That's so ridiculous and so unreal. But, but this, this Steve Muncy, oh my goodness, that has got to be one of the worst uh, false teachers. Counterfeit revivalists because he comes up with all these weird ideas and he helps this woman from the other side of Tampa Bay. I cannot uh, uh, tell you what's in their hearts, therefore I cannot judge that. Maybe they are genuinely thinking they're doing what's right. If that's the case, then they're deceived themselves. But I can tell you that they're deceiving people by the multitudes with all of this garbage. And they're seeing angels. Boy, they're always saying an angel. Do you ever meet these people? And the Lord said this, and the Lord told me that. And the Lord told... They're ruining it because God can speak. But he doesn't speak to people every five minutes. He doesn't tell you what color of dress to wear or what tie to put on. Let's be rational. rational. Let's be sensible. Let's be reasonable. And let's know that God works through his word. And we stand on, our, on his word. One preacher some time back he said, I'm getting tired of it, he said. Now listen to it on TV. I'm getting tired, he said. Our people, meaning in his group, are getting too tied to the Bible. He said, we're getting too tied to the Bible. 
He said, what we have got to do is loose our grip there and let the Holy Ghost move and give us experiences. Have you ever watched, I, I asked you a few minutes ago and didn't give you a chance to answer. Have you ever watched this laughter thing on TV? How many have ever done that? You ever watch the laughter stuff? If that's not the most embarrassing thing I have ever seen in the name of the Lord, that, that's, the, that's disgusting. Friends, do, do not be afraid to stand up and say, that's wrong. Well, I went on to Channel 22 a few years ago and denounced it and wrote a Leslie's Living Letter. What was it called, Ruth? And this, this laughing business, we called it. This is a few years ago. I was attacked ferociously, and here's what they said about yours truly. Lest he shouldn't act like that because the only thing he has against it is that it's not in the Bible. <laughs> we want to be free. I want God to have his way in this ministry and do whatever he wants. But I'm not going to turn this thing loose and have demonstrations of the flesh all over the place. I happen to believe in the nine gifts of the Spirit. Are they for today? They're for today. Are all nine of them for today? They're all nine of them for today. But they're not to be showpieces to show off in front of others. They are to allow the Holy Ghost to grip us with power so that we can be a blessing to other people. Paul was having this in the church at Colossae. They were having these spooky revelations. They were introducing new stuff. Of course, nobody's done that more than the Roman Catholic Church, as you know. We'll come to that momentarily in just a, a few minutes. Anyway, where were we? Uh, Look what it says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23. Are you at that point with where I'm at? Only a little bit here of Jeremiah 23. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts. You remember that, don't you? The Lord of hosts. Concerning the prophets, behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall for from... The prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Look, friends, we're far from perfect. God knows he can do whatever he wants in here. But he's going to have to do it because I'm not going to spend 20 minutes drumming people up emotionally and singing 200 choruses and asking for 45 minutes for an offering. We're not going to do it. We're going to preach the word and then let God have his way. Is that not all right to do it that way? That's the Bible way. Preach the word and let God have his way. And that's where there's lasting results that happen. Verse 16, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. And they say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. In other words, they prophesy nothing but good for this whole world. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, and yet they prophesied. I have heard what the prophets said, so-called prophets, false prophets. Christian television is full of them. I have heard what the, prof what the prophets said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Look this way. A person sometime back it up and said, I received, not in these meetings, in, in a particular place, but in this country, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and I spoke with other tongues. And then they said this, and it happened as I was worshiping the Virgin Mary who helped me through to the experience. Now there's two issues there. One is tongues. God put it in the church. It's been misused terribly. Let's leave that aside for the moment. As soon as the pastor in that church heard that visitor say, it was brought about by me worshiping Mary. By the way, the pastor got up and endorsed it. Said, this shows you God can do anything. God's doing wonderful things today. False. It was a wrong spirit. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was a false spirit that did it. There are familiar spirits. Let's take... Let's take Medjugorje. Anybody ever hear, hear, ever hear of Medjugorje? Put up your hand. Medjugorje. 
Medjugorje, a place in Europe, and that's where these little children many years ago, they're adults today, but it was in our generation, these little children all had a vision, and Mary, the Queen of Heaven, met with them. And she came down and told them stuff this long. And then she came the next day, and the next day, and it went on and on and on and on. And of course, then the Roman Catholic Church made it a special kind of a shrine. And to this day, you can get tours here in America, which will take you to Medjugorje. And when you look up, the sun in the sky will spin round and round. And, and Let me tell you what happened at Medjugorje, which was the same thing that happened at Lourdes, which was the same thing that happened at Fima in Portugal. It's what's called a familiar spirit. The Bible calls the fact that there are angels, good angels, there's demons, and the demons don't all appear bad. They are bad, but they don't all appear bad. Many times demons are what's called familiar spirits. That is, they'll know something about the subject or the person. And so they go ahead and say things that makes it look like they are that person. And so a demon comes along and says, I am the Virgin Mary. And these little children accept it and believe it, and they, they, they run away and get their parents, and then it starts to spread, and then it becomes a commercial wonderland, and the Catholic Church makes millions of dollars out of it. Let me look you in the eye and tell you, it is a bunch of garbage. It's mysticism. It was a familiar spirit. It is not of God, because if it was of God, you would have to commit the sin of necromancy, according to the Old Testament, which is communicating with the dead is what Mary is. Mary's dead. She wanted to be with the Lord, but she died. But that's what's happening in Catholicism today. And here we have in the Protestant church, in the charismatic area, and I'm not against the basic gifts nor even the motives of people. There's a lot of good people. I'm talking about the misuse. And the misuse is awful. Imagine saying, as I was worshiping Mary, she gave me the gift of the Holy Ghost. You don't worship Mary. We don't have Mary in devotion whatsoever. It's a false spirit. You could sit and watch Christian television and they'll sing beautiful songs. They may have some fellow to give a beautiful testimony and then the preacher gets up and talks garbage and most people won't know it. Most people won't understand what he's saying. Like that one I told you about, you know, I went to heaven and I missed the Holy Ghost. What in the world are we talking about? And it's accepted by these Christian television presidents. It's invaded the church. It's everywhere. And this spookiness, this visions, this emotionalism, these experiences is mostly either on Catholicism on the one side or the charismatics on the other. And there's an awful lot of very sincere people in both. We're not judging the hearts. We're judging the mysticism, which is not of God. I feel better for saying all that, to tell you the truth. I feel better for saying it. Behold, verse 31, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and, and say, He saith. Behold, I am against them that profess false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Look this way. Now listen to this carefully. Now listen to it real carefully. I send out an appeal. Let's say a preacher sends an appeal to a million people. He gets 50,000 people to reply. One person out of the 50,000 tells him, after I sent you $1,000, my great granny died and left me $200,000. You know what the preacher does? He ignores the other 950,000 who never replied. Ignores them. You don't hear about them. The ones that failed. They're not even talked about. Nor even the ones that did give to him, and he hasn't heard many testimonies. But he grabs this story as if giving him the $1,000 caused the Aunt Jane or whoever, the granny, to die and leave the $200,000. He joins those two things and says, look what happened to brother and sister so-and-so. They sent me $1,000 and three days later they got $50,000 or they got $200,000. The whole idea is that if you give the $1,000, the exact same thing will happen to you. This is con man at the height of their ability and it comes into your home 24 hours a day on Christian television. Go ahead, you might as well do it. I said it now anyway, I said it. 
So look at this list of things here. False humility. The worship of angels. Hearing voices. And if God speaks to you, that's all right. But don't, put, don't blame God on everything that you hear. Deception in the church. Mormonism. Roman Catholicism. Charismatics, etc., etc., etc. Catholicism, of course, is the worst of all. I heard one man one day, he had, he had counted up. You know, where Roman Catholics have the nails that went into Jesus' hands. But they've got so many around the world, he went around there and counted them up, and he found out that they weighed 16 tons. It's a con game. There are people, there's such sincere people, they'll go to Rome to, to hear that little man stand in the balcony. Look at him. He's got a funny hat and a dress on. I mean, that ought to arouse your suspicions immediately. There's something wrong here. A funny hat and a dress. If I went out in a funny hat and a dress, what in the world did they send for a wee black van and take you away for two or three weeks? And he opens his mouth and says nothing. And you know that. Doesn't inspire you, doesn't bless you. And yet, oh, oh. It's foolishness, friends. What are you going to go by? You better go by this. You better go by God's word and nothing else. And never mind these mystics. Asceticism. Are you glad I'm off that bit now? Asceticism. I didn't really get started on that, but. But you know what makes you mad, friends? when you know that there's a real and a beautiful. Right. Healing is a beautiful thing. But, but I, I, I hardly want to watch any Christian television relating to healing because they always bring it alongside of either money or some demonstration that makes the preacher look great but knocking everybody down. If, 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 you knock somebody, if somebody falls down, that, that's not a thing to, to display at all. What, what we should be displaying is God's Word. And an exegesis of God's Word. But you see, we are emotional, experience-oriented people, and we want something that tickles our fancy. So we want to look at this. Foolishness. Do you ever read where Jesus and the twelve disciples went around laughing all day long? Uncontrollable laughing. Did Paul do that? I read about Paul weeping. I don't read about him laughing. I would ask the Lord to help me to be a bit straighter in the things that I say. Get to the point a bit quicker. Asceticism. Colossians 2, verses 20 through 23. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? You're not allowed to touch this. You're not allowed to taste that. You're not allowed to handle the other thing, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of man, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and world worship. They look good. And humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. What's that all about? Well, look this way. You can go to the extremes. I've never been in the Philippines, but I've seen pictures of it where they will actually put these kind of hooks. Donald, have you been in the Philippines? No. They put these hooks in their body. Have you ever noticed this? And put weights upon them. And they'll actually put some of them on the cross. At Easter, they'll put them on the cross to crucify them. They don't actually die, but they put them there to ameliorate or do away with their sins. I told you about the mountain that we have in Ireland. It's called Knock, K-N-O-C-K, just like the word Knock, but it's a little mountain, really just a big hill, all rocky. And they go there, and they climb up on their hands and knees to get peace with God. And, of course, there's ambulances at the bottom. And if you fall and break an arm or break a leg and get bloodied up, and the ambulance has to take you away, good for you. That's more points with God because of what? Asceticism. Because that self-denial, that self-hurt. I will do something to punish myself. I will do this. Fasting is good. But if you're trying to impress God with your fasting, then you lost the whole motive out of it. That's asceticism. That's me trying to do my own thing in order to impress God for his salvation. That won't work either. Why don't we get to the point where we say we can't do it? Lord Jesus, you're the only one that can save us. Please save us and let us walk in the joy of the Lord and he will lead and guide us and direct us. <laughs> Praise God. It's self-denial in place of spiritual growth. Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold 
no water. There's people in America all the time are, are all forever going to another convention, another seminar, another convention. And nowadays, have you noticed everybody's a prophet? I'm, I'm tired of these prophets. Everybody on TV is prophet so-and-so or apostle so-and-so or doctor so-and-so. When they open their, you, and you listen to them for 10 minutes and they open their mouths and talk, you don't get that much. Am I too hard? No. Broken cisterns. It's all emotion. You're a woman of destiny. You've got to come. One evangelist actually said in TV, if you're down and you have no money, what you've got to do is this. They actually said this in TV. You get an attache case, a briefcase. And find an office that you can borrow for five minutes, plead with a boss, and sit there with your attache case in a big fancy office and get your picture taken and sent it out. And if you're not a success, fake it till you make it. That's the word. This is from evangelism. Fake it till you make it. Look successful, and success will come to you. Or Robert Schuller, he tells us to possibilitize it. Oh, friends, what are we up to? What are we up to? Robert Schuller, whom I also know, and in my youthful days of indiscretion, actually preached for him more than once in the Crystal Cathedral years ago. I say that as an aside and as a joke, but to read what's going on nowadays, it's just absolutely unbelievable because he said, listen to it, that Jesus died on Calvary to sanctify the human ego. That's a quote. No, he didn't die to sanctify the human ego at all. Jesus died to rescue lost sinners and to deal with their sin and save us from hell for his honor and for his glory, not to sanctify the human ego. We're supposed to kill the human ego. We're supposed to get rid of the I and let Christ come in, according to Galatians 2 and chapter 20. It's not popular to teach that. Don't hew out cisterns. Don't run here and run there and run all over the place. Find somebody who can teach you God's word and be satisfied and then put a value upon it. Say, I'm not going to miss it. We're almost through. Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31. An appalling and horrible thing has happened, has happened in, the, in the land. Can I read that again? An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority, and my people love it so. Look this way, my last illustration. Sometime back a preacher said he was going, before he was married himself, he was going with this girl. He said he was preaching. And while he was preaching... He disappeared, but he was still there, but he disappeared. And he doesn't know what happened because he didn't come back to 15 minutes later. But God took him out into the back seat of a car in a town 15 miles away. And in the back seat, he watched his girlfriend, as he thought, and another man committing adultery. Watch the details. Then come back into his body from 15 miles away, 15 minutes later, didn't know what to say because didn't know what he had been saying, but God showed him that and God delivered him from that. They prophesy lies. Well, we need these visions and we need this spookiness. We need this mysticism, the last verse. It's not the last verse, the last verse in our notes. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all angels and powers and principalities and authorities. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ. And Christ alone. And Christ forever. Hallelujah. Now you know we're past the time, so let me take just two minutes and say, is anybody here, here, here? There's a lot of people here tonight, and you want to ask a question strictly on the subject, uh, not about the man whose number is 666 or some other subject, strictly this subject. Ask a quick question or make a comment. Uh, you're welcome to do it right now, and I'll repeat what you said so that it's picked up on the camera. And uh, just a comment. Is this too hard for us? or? Did you get something from this? Let me know if you did or not, friend. It's right what I told you. Don't, don't, don't be tricked by the mysticism that hit Colossae and that's hitting Christian television today, notwithstanding some of the beautiful things that's on it, like a couple of the men I mentioned and others. And others. Anybody want to put up your hand quickly? Do it quickly. Want to make a comment or ask a question?
Comment or question? Com there's one back there. Steve? Well, well that, that, that's a terrific point. Uh, Steve said this is, I guess he said, almost scary, amazing, because God was dealing with this problem. It's approximately two and a half thousand years ago in the day of Jeremiah about all this falseness going on. You'd think, you know, it would have been dealt with by now. And here we are, Steve, with all our modern equipment and means of getting out the gospel. And I have no hesitation in saying this. And I close with this. That's a promise that the church has never had more deception in its history than it's got today. And I will tell you the scripture for it, and then we're completely through. The Bible says it will be in the last days, the day of the Laodicean church, the last days, when the church will say, and it's the only church that could have said this out of all the phases of the church, it's the only church that could have said, we are rich and increased with goods and of need of nothing. We've got our television stations. We've got our beautiful air-conditioned sanctuaries. We have got everything. We've got our seminars. We've got our radio programs. We're rich and increased with goods and we have need of nothing. You know what Jesus said? You think that's the truth, but the real truth is you're wretched and poor and miserable and blind and naked. And you know the only thing worse than being wretched and poor and miserable and blind and naked is to be wretched and poor and miserable and blind and naked and not know that you're wretched and poor and miserable and blind and naked. And that's what Jesus said. You don't know it. Because while you're in that terrible condition, you're thinking we're rich and increased with goods and of need of nothing. And what they say, like the old time Nicolaitans, those that rule the laity, book of Revelation, Jesus hated their works. What they say, they're on television. It glamorizes the person. He's got to be right. I mean, it's said on television. It's got to be right. And so, if, you, if, you know, if you've got a loved one who's dying and, and you've only got $100 left and the preacher tells you that you can get them healed by setting your seed of $100, then you'll fire it off immediately. You'd be cruel if you didn't, unless you know better. We're subject to such mysticism. Asceticism and legalism goes into it too. I've nothing more to say. Stand and let's praise the Lord. Will we please? In Jesus' name. Come on. Stand, everybody, and praise the Lord. Put your hands together.